you know, we artists just love colors. And we're going to like go color mad today. Jane Blundell is here from Sydney, Australia. Jane, what are you going to do today? I'm going to do some demonstrations of really fascinating color mixes that might really surprise you. Ah, I like that because, you know, we, we can use these in so many different ways, but sometimes we don't think of them. So I think what we'll do is get right to your teaching. Okay. It's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. Okay, so here we are. I have the colors written out. I'm using Pyrrhal Crimson, which is a beautiful crimson color, and Thalo Green, which is a scary color because it's so powerful. But the together, these beautiful festive colors create an incredible range. And so the crimson is going to give this wonderful richness. And when you mix them together, they create an amazing range. And I've said that before. They create an amazing range of really deep maroon colors and beautiful dark greens and even a black. And it's a surprising pair. So when we're working with them, you can be a little bit um, amazed at what's possible. I'm going to use a, it's about a quarter inch flat to do these mixes and put a little bit of each one on the palette and then mix them together. And I like to do these in a really random manner rather than really neatly because that way you see some surprising combinations next to each other. Whereas if you do them going from the red to the green really, really logically, you miss out on some of these combinations. So just testing your colors and see what they do, you learn a lot. But I think if you do them in a mathematical way, you miss out on some of the beautiful artistic qualities of what we're doing. And for those of you who are fairly new to painting, this is also a really great opportunity to practice your brush strokes and see how close you can get them together. So it becomes a, a color understanding and painting practice. So could you so tell you us what your surface is that you're painting on? Oh, this is a, an Arches 300 um, GSM, which is 140 pound um, cold press paper, which is my favorite. I always like to work with cold press because I love the granulation of watercolor. And you'll see a lot more of that on the cold press than you will on smooth. From here, it's kind of hard to tell. It looks It looks pretty smooth, but... You're getting that, okay. that granulation in there. Yes, so you're just, what you're doing here is you're just changing the percentage of red and green that you put together. That's right. And also the percentage of water, because of course, with watercolor, we don't add white or black um, if possible. We just change the amount of water to, to change the colors. So I'm doing some that are full strength and then some that are just adding a little bit of water and that lightens them. If you do add white, it changes the quality of the of the paint. You get a pastel look instead of uh, that lovely clarity of watercolor. So you can see that there's some beautiful, uh, rich maroon colors, as well as deep greens and a black and all sorts of colors that are really quite hard to mix. The colors of cherries and aubergines and um, figs and grapes and then you've got all these lovely deep, deep greens as well. I would have never thought about the the purplish colors that you're getting by adding green into them. Just two colors, yeah. They're, they're quite difficult to make otherwise, but this makes it very easy. And then now the why black, thalo instead of like a viridian? I'm sorry? Why thalo instead of something like viridian? Well, that's actually a really good question. So they have very, very different qualities. So phthalo green is very, very powerful and non-graining, non-granulating and staining. Whereas viridian is a much more gentle and granulating pigment. So it wouldn't give the richness. It wouldn't match the richness of the crimson because it's so much more gentle. It's almost the same hue, but it's a completely different strength 
and that's one of the things about watercolour is we get to play with all these beautiful different characteristics, not just colour. So these very soft, um, very soft colours as well, uh, the colour of vegetation. You can see how these are very festive colours mm -hmm. and lovely cherry reds and all those sorts of things. So it's quite extraordinary what you can do with just two. And these are perfectly mixing opposite pair, which means that they will make the, the rich black. They completely cancel each other out. In my studies of watercolour, I've mixed pretty much every colour with every colour. And this is one of the really ones, the ones that really excited me because I just thought, hey, wow, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected that. So you you have stabilized on the palette that we see. Do you use any other colors ever? And these are the only colors you use, or just this just for this example? I've I've come up with a palette of 15 colors that I can use to create anything. And I've written two books that actually use those same 15 colors. Um, and these are key, key to that. Phthalo green is a color that I strongly well strongly suggest you don't use on its own unless you've got a really good reason. But it's a, as a mixing colour, it is amazing. So phthalo green is a fantastic mixing green. Um, most of the other greens that I use are a mixture of a blue and a yellow, or a green and a yellow. Um, but you can see that this one gives quite an incredible range of uh, really lovely greens. and. Oh, that's, yum. and that's really yummy. And you got some beautiful greys in there. Yeah, and a rich black, which Absolutely. I call James Black. <laughs> and you have a um, a picture of an onion that I've painted using that colour. I'm sure I do. I just don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I've got rocks. I have other rocks. I have a baboon. I have flowers, but I'm not seeing the onion. Maybe my producers see it. Okay, it was sent through for this particular demonstration, but right. that's okay. I could find it and show it if you like. So the Jane's, there it is. Okay, excellent. Well, that, that really makes sense on those colors then. And the Jane's black is actually a color that you have out that, that one of the manufacturers produces, is that correct? Yes, yes, it's available from Daniel Smith. Yeah, so there I just I, I only know that because uh, I have a tube, and I was wondering Jane who. Now I know Jane Blundell. <laughs> so you have an interesting little water cup. I've not seen one like that. Three, you have the uh, opportunity to clean clean your brushes more thoroughly. Tell us about this. Sorry, the palette. No, you're well, I, I'm curious about your palette too. It looks like a little metal palette. Yes, it is. So this one, I, I think it's really important to always have at least two um, sources of water, one for clean and one for dirty. And I tend to use these, which are a Chinese, um, very traditional Chinese ink painting design. And I wear, use them in different sizes. So this is specifically quite small to fit on the camera. But what's wonderful about them is you've got obviously clean water and mixing water, and you can always use clean water in your colours. Um, so either I'll use two containers if I'm doing something separate, but on my desk, these are very stable and they work beautifully. There's a, a bigger one as well. This one's oh. a Japanese one, and it's incredible that it's been made with hollow um, ceramic. But they're beautiful. fantastic. I love porcelain, and these are just beautiful to use. Now, do you always do your mixtures on your little uh, palette there when you're working in your studio? Do you have something that gives you more mixing space? Sometimes I'll use a um, another palette to do it. Um, so I might use um, a piece of, you know, another piece of porcelain or one of these, um, you know, they're generally porcelain or else in the palette itself. So it depends how many mixes I'm using. If I'm just mixing two colors together, just doing it on the palette works very well. The next one I want to show you is uh, mixing another pair of opposites. So this time it's a red and a blue. Now red and blue aren't generally considered opposite, 
but this is such an orangey red and such a greeny blue that they do end up being mixing opposites. And um, you have a colour wheel that shows a whole range of mixing opposites, all of which, when they mix together, will go black. So this is the Pyrrhal Scarlet and the Thalo Blue Green Shade. You still there? I'm here. I'm right okay. here. <laughs> I'm just mesmerized. Now, this is another amazing mixing pair. And I, I don't know that the um, watercolor companies will really like me for saying this, but if you have this combination, there's a whole lot that you don't need to buy. And I'll show you. So if I take that phthalo blue green shade and add a tiny bit of the red, it will start to um, dull it down slightly and it will create just a little bit more of a dull. It'll take some of that brilliance out, slightly neutralize it. But if I keep going, then we have a Prussian blue hue. So a hue is not the actual color, it's not the Prussian blue pigment, but it's the color of Prussian blue. So, so there's what, what, what was here. the native color, the uh, local color you started with? I started with phthalo blue green shade. Phthalo blue green. And then I've added a little bit of the pyrrhal scarlet and that makes a Prussian blue hue. And if I keep going, add a bit more, it's going to make an indigo hue. So there's another color that you don't have to buy. I, but I, go, love, I love buying colors. I love having all those tubes. <laughs> well, so do I, so do I. But if you actually paint on location as I do, then I like to knock it back to fewer. So I, I, I love to explore the colors, but I also find it fascinating how many you can make just with a few. So I mentioned that that 15 colors that I've, that I work with a lot, so when you um, take make... your little mini palette out with you on a trip, do you take any tubes to refill or do you, will that no. last you the whole trip? I, I don't tend to. Um, I mean, if I am, if I'm away for a few weeks on a teaching trip, then I might, but this will actually, even though these are smaller than a half pan, they, um, they will last for a very, very long time because you don't actually use that much. Now you can see here, there's an Indian red hue and I'm going to lighten that one as well. And if I add more of the red, we can make a, um, um, a light red hue. Once again, add water. So I'm doing these also randomly. I think if this I is a, a great exercise blue. that everybody should try. And, and really you do that by combining every color with every color in your palette. So you really get to know what the capabilities are. Yes, and I've got all those on my website. So you can actually see where I've mixed um, literally thousands of, of different colors together. Um, and it can be really helpful to, to see you know, what might interest you. So when you get these exactly right, once again, you get a black because they are you know perfect mixing opposites. So they'll completely neutralize um, each other down to a black. And my plan here is just to make each of these different. So if one of them looks a little bit the same as something else, I just add a bit more color or add more water. And the other thing that um, is, is just good to keep in mind is you don't want to have too much moisture on the brush. So you'll notice I'm, I'm wiping the brush on the edge uh, just to take off that excess. If I go a little bit more back towards the blue, we're going into a nice denim or indigo kind of color again, and then adding more water. And if it starts to get a bit too messy, then I'll switch over to another palette. Well, those are nice, convenient little palettes. Yes. The porcelain is, is the most beautiful mixing surface. Um, and then um, enameled, um, an emerald brass like this is also lovely. Aren't they amazing? Just so many different colors created with 
Just well, I went out this weekend and I went to a, I don't know, World Market or Pier One or one of those big companies and I bought a platter. It must be 12 or 15 inches square. It's porcelain uh, because I'm so used to a big mixing space that I, I felt like painting watercolor, I needed more mixing space. But I'm a little bit more rambunctious than you are. You're very, very careful. Which is lovely. Yeah, I tend to work in a very, um, well, very controlled. <laughs> but not always. I sometimes throw the paint around. Well, that's why you're one of the world's leading watercolor artists. <laughs> and I'm so not. There we have that amazing range, once again, a mixing pair that will go into a black, but it'll create from the blue, it'll create um, Prussian blue hues and indigo hues and light red, Venetian red, um, Indian red, um, carpet mortem, violet, and then a black in between. So it's another incredible pair of colours. So we've got the crimson and the green and the scarlet and the phthalo blue. And then you've got time for one more? Yeah, sure. I think, I think everybody would love that. So this is actually one of my absolute favourites, in fact. Um, it doesn't go completely to a black, but it goes to a beautiful grey. And I'll wipe out, just wipe out quickly the previous mix. And so this is using burnt sienna and ultramarine. And burnt sienna is um, by its nature an orange. And burnt sienna is one of those ones that was going to vary a little bit by brand. So some brands of burnt sienna are more of a brown and some are more of an orange. And my preference is the ones that are more of a brown. So it's a sort of a, it's a neutralized orange color, but it also has the advantage that if you water it down, you can. That can be a very convenient skin tone, just as it is. So it. Um, whereas if you use the more orange ones that are made out of a different pigment, um, they'll make you look a bit jaundiced if you use them as a as a skin tone. So it sort of has that extra, uh, extra advantage, and it's also lovely in landscape. And I do a lot of landscapes and rocks and those sorts of natural studies. So I prefer ones made with the pigment called PBR seven, and. Uh, and rather than the pigment um, PR, which is pigment red 101. So that's burnt sienna and ultramarine, and they will also neutralize each other. So by that I mean they will take some of the brightness out of each other. So well, they're they're technically opposites, right? Because of the color wheel. They are. Yes, let, they are. Let me just show a color wheel real quickly. Um, so you guys can see that a burnt sienna is an orange and it would be opposite of a blue. Yes, and so that, that um, color wheel is a specifically a mixing opposites color wheel. So it's not your traditional color wheel that's based around a tribe. It's absolutely every color sh shown with its, um, with its opposite. So the yellow and the purple, the purple is created to be the perfect opposite of the yellow so that when they mix together, they go black. Or as close so to black as I can. And you're going to go into detail and depth about that kind of stuff on Watercolor Live, is that right? Well, I won't go into so much detail that confuses people because I'm on the essentials day. So, but I'll certainly be going into how to work with just a beautiful triad and just explore three colors and what they can do. So what I'll be talking about in Watercolor Live is how to work with three colors and mix those in, in pairs and then also the three together, and you'll be amazed at what you can do with it. So it's a, the same idea. It's exploring what you can do with a, a well-chosen triad. I'll just get a little bit more on this. You got me? Yep. Okay. Now, the same thing as we looked at before, as I just start to add a tiny bit of the blue into the burnt sienna, we create uh, burnt umber hues. So there it goes from the burnt sienna into a burnt umber. And keep in mind that a lot of these things, um, some people are not quite, they don't never really thought it through, but if you take raw sienna and you, um, and you heat it, then that's the burnt sienna. 
So the same pigment gets treated in a different way and becomes a whole new, a whole new colour. So if you take raw umber and heat that, it becomes burnt umber. So what I'm looking at here is the greys that you can create. We have more of the um, ultramarine. What happens when you add a tiny bit of the burnt sienna to that is it deepens it and creates nice. almost like an indanthron blue sort of hue. Yeah, it's kind and of these, a purpley tone. Yeah, these will also give you some kind of indigo, warm indigo or um, sort of like denim colours. And then we come back through the middle and there's once again a deliberately random because you see combinations that you might not have thought of putting together or realise that they could be made with this, with just two colours. And I'm constantly adding more water and changing it. And then if we go quite strong, we'll go not to a black. These ones won't quite go to a black, but they will go to um, a beautiful grey and a range of greys, some of which will be slightly on the blue side, some can be completely neutral, and some can be slightly warmer on the, on the brown side. You know, this is a really terrific exercise to do because it, it forces you to add the water so that you're thinning it and creating the sense of value. Yes, so and value you... is so important. A lot of people don't appreciate that, if you know, a really good painting is going to have really dark darks and really light lights and everything in between but getting that full range of values is um it, it's valuable <laughs> do, you, do you find that you have to restate things uh a after it dries you have to go back over it to darken your darks yes yeah, sometimes i do um because i don't like to work with watercolor too thick and so i'll often choose to give two coats rather than just one uh, so I'll, I'll make it deliberately um, you know, a little bit more milky or creamy rather than going too thick. And then, then I may have to go over it. Or I may go over a, a grey with, um, with a black for impact. I am loving this. So looking more at these browns and light browns. It's just extraordinary what you can do. And this is what I, I'm always talking to my, my students about is how much you can do with just two colors. So I've done whole paintings with these. In fact, the painting that's um, behind me um, that's been printed uh, for, as, a, as a decal for my wall uh, is just basically done with, with this James Gray mm. here. It just proves that you don't really need a lot of colors. Well, that's right. And as I say, that's not necessarily going to be a popular thing. Yeah, well, we'll still buy them anyway. We will, yes, because they're just so gorgeous. So this one gives uh, a wonderful range from the burnt sienna through all these burnt umbers, beautiful in warm indigos, beautiful greys, not quite black, though you come very, very close. Um, but all right, it's, it's, so, a, it's a gorgeous mix. So I'm going to throw a little challenge your way. You may or may not accept it. Would you either on that piece of paper or on another piece of paper, just take that two color range there and maybe put together a little imagined landscape just so we can see it in action. Would you be willing to do that? Sure. I'm sorry to drop that on you. I don't mean to shock you like this, but. <laughs> All right. All right. So while you're getting ready for that, I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. I'm just going to take a quick break and then we'll have you right back. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, our guest today is Jane Blundell in Australia, Sydney, Australia. And I'm learning so much. I'm doing a lot of watercolor lately. And I have learned so much on Watercolor Live that I really want to just tell you about it. It's really exciting. And we are uh, getting close as January comes.
This could be our largest watercolor live yet, a worldwide audience, people teaching and attending from all over the world. It's really a lot of fun because you get to know a lot of other artists. You get to interact with and ask questions of people like Jane, who will be teaching on the Essential Techniques Day. For those of you who are new, you might just say, well, I'll just do the Essential Techniques Day. But what ends up happening, everybody always says, you know what, I'm just going to do the whole thing because you don't want to miss any of it. 25 top masters teaching watercolor. It's a lot of fun. So uh, also coming up, I just want to mention to you that because of the holiday, we have what's going on is the 12 days of Christmas every day uh, we have in our email, we're sending out uh, uh, a special, something that you can get special on special, right? And you just can find out what that is at painttube.tv, which is where we have uh, hundreds, six or seven hundred art instruction videos uh, from the world's leading artists. That's at painttube.tv. Okay, now we're going to go back to Jane and we're going to, uh, we've challenged her to do a little bit of a, a, a little imagined landscape using the colors that she was just teaching us. All right, Jane, you're back. Okay. All right, I'm going to do an imaginary landscape, basically using the combination of um, burnt sienna and ultramarine. So um, I would normally allow things to dry in between, but um, I'm not going to have that option. So I'm going to start with a really, really light tone. So I, I call this a, a, a tea or a weak tea tone. So it just is going to give a little bit of a sense of the sky. And for the because these are liftable or non-staining non pigments, I can lift out a few clouds to create a little bit of an idea of there being you know, a soft, bit of softness in the sky. And whereas I would normally have let this wash completely dry before, before carrying it on, I'm going to just soften that edge and sort of dry it off a little bit. And then I'll think about some mountains. So the mountains, because the paper is, is damp, are going to soften into the background a little bit more than they otherwise would, but that's okay. So I'm coming in with the next tone, which is going to be a little bit stronger. And I'm going to put in a couple of distant mountains, which will then soften out again as I come through here. And I've left the rest of this paper drier. Now that's a little bit more fuzzy than it otherwise would have been, but that's all right. I don't mind the challenge. This is actually the same combination mixed up as a premix. And I'm now going to go with a stronger, a stronger mix again. So I think of this as wheat tea and then tea. And now I'm kind of going into um, a sort of a coffee mix. So you can see there's movement. It's, it's kind of like water. And I'll bring down a, a mountain range. Well, I know just of, where that is. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of little trees and things that can just softly go into the background and add a bit of water to that. And that will give it a little bit of structure and then down the bottom it's nearly always a little darker as you get down to the water's edge so i'll go a bit darker there and then using stronger again and a kind of a dry brush technique i'm just going to give the effect of that sparkle of water so the water has a very horizontal look to it so i'm just going to sparkle some water across down here wow and then go really thick. So this is about as thick as I'd ever use watercolour. Um, it's really kind of creamy. So we've got wheat tea, tea, kind of coffee, cream, water, uh, sorry, and, um, and then this sort of cream. And put in this, uh, this rock formation to great, make the foreground. And then there's kind of a fun effect that you can do to give it a bit of a sparkle. And that's to use um, a credit card or even a um, a, a palette knife to scrape out some of the paint and that gives a little bit of a an idea of the sun hitting these rocks pretty effective so this is a you know you wanted a quick one so you're getting quick <laughs> yeah, i like it and then we need to do something to connect the foreground and the background so we'll come in with uh would you tell us why you want to connect the foreground and the background? Well, 
it just makes it more interesting. So rather than them being um, completely separate, um, I'm sort of working on a, on a rule of thirds. So I'm thinking about a tree coming across along here. So I've kind of divided that. So I'm going to have this tree coming up. And it really ought to be a gum tree, I suppose, since I'm coming to you from Australia. Yeah, so thanks. Um, but gum trees don't necessarily um, sit themselves on rocks. Although there are some angophoras that do. Well, it's behind the rock. Yeah, so it's coming in from over here. And then one of the nicest ways I find to do um, vegetation is to use a natural sea sponge and just put it on nice and easily. So then you've got a super fast tonal landscape made out of burnt sienna and ultramarine. Outstanding. Okay, Jane, well, thank you so much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Uh, why don't we have you come back on camera and say goodbye? Okay. So, Jane, that was spectacular. I learned a lot from that. That's very helpful. I'm doing a lot of watercolor these days, and I can't wait to get into the studio and try what you just taught us. Thank you so much for that. Good uh, on you. Uh, that looks like one of your works behind you, the big tree. Yes, yes. This is a, oh, it's one of my favorite trees. I've painted it and drawn it since I was about 17. Um, and it's a great big Morton Bay fig. And uh, I've done it in, in etchings and in paintings and in ink drawings. And this one's basically done with that same combination of burnt sienna and ultramarine. So it's, uh, um, it's got a lot of detail. <laughs> yeah, well, it just shows people that, you know, you can make a spectacular painting with a value study. You don't have to have all yeah. that extra color. Much as we love color. <laughs> That's right. We sure do. Well, Jane, thank you so much. We'll put all your contact information in the comments. And we really appreciate you teaching us about what you can do with these interesting color combinations today. And we are so honored that you would be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, our guest today was Jane Blundell, and uh, she's in Sydney, Australia. Make sure you give her thumbs up and applause so that uh, she gets the accolades she deserves. You know, um, I didn't have to do much translating there. You know, oftentimes I'm the translator trying to make everybody understand what's really going on, but she is such a good teacher. I didn't have to do any translating, which makes my job easier. I just get to sit there and play, right? And just watch, which is really fun. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, remember, get signed up for Watercolor Live. It's coming up. And don't forget about the 12 days of Christmas at paintube.tv. I'm Eric Rhodes. Make sure to subscribe to this program. If you haven't, uh, we're here every weekday at 12 noon. Uh, just go to YouTube and look up Art School Live with Eric Rhodes. And also give me a follow on social media at Eric Rhodes. Thanks again.